366, Chapter 1 of Herland. Book talk begins at 18 minutes. Welcome to Craftlid. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road. New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 366, Herlandia. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by Survival Organs, handmade organs to throw, love, or cuddle at Etsy. And March Hare Yarns, hand-dyed yarns just for you. You can visit the March Hare at Etsy. And Subbable the site where you can go to support your favorite content creators. Visit subbable.com slash craftlit and sign up for perks and fun. Links to all of our sponsors can be found in the show notes at craftlit.com. Remember, their support for the show is what keeps it free for you. So go have a look. Well, hello. My goodness gracious, it has been so long since I have spoken to you. I mean, like this. There were those bonus episodes that I released, but those were bonuses. It wasn't our time together. You know, the normal thing, the routine. Oh, and if you have the bonus track with the interview about the teaching book, please reload it if you do not hear the Craftlet theme song immediately when it starts. There was a problem with the file and it's a long story, but just reload it until you hear or refresh until you hear the Craftlet theme song. But here we are, we're back, we're back. And I have such a great book for you. It's weird, it's different, it's unlike anything we've ever done on the show <laughs> in these past eight and a half years. So yeah, it was about time that we get around to this one, I think. Now, one of the things that happens at the beginning of a book on this podcast, which is kind of different from other podcasts because we do books and so they go in order and chapter to chapter to chapter. And so that gives listeners a choice. You can listen in real time and listen to it like a serial where every week you have the next chapter and you have to wait for the next one to come out. Or you can do what some other listeners do and you can hoard all of the episodes and hold on to them until the book is done or close to done and then listen to them all at once and kind of binge listen the way that you might binge watch say Orphan Black not that I've done anything like that mind you so normally at the beginning of a book i do a little introduction about how the podcast works and longtime listeners can kind of scoot past that part because they already know but this time a couple of things have changed it's been a It's been a long, dark tea time of the soul. And I've been going through and rethinking things. And so I decided to make a couple changes at Craftlet. Now, don't worry. Don't freak out. The podcast will still be here every week, uploading new chapters, audiobooks with benefits, the whole thing. That part doesn't change. What is going to change a little bit is at the beginning. It's been called Craftlet. And for the longest time, it's been very knitting heavy because... I was knitting a lot, and a lot of the people who listened knit and crocheted, and and so it was very fibery. And from time to time, I've had had my romances with other crafts, whether it was zentangling or crazy quilting a thousand years ago or, or whatever. And then I started doing this a couple of years ago. I was asking people, what do you do when you listen to Craftlet? And I have a Google Doc full of information, because y'all are really pretty interesting people. And you do a lot of really cool things. And so I started thinking, well, maybe what I should do is kind of go month to month or every two or three weeks, switch up and introduce all of us to crafts that maybe we hadn't gotten into before or experienced before, or we kind of looked at and got, "Mm, I don't know if that's my thing, but I know you, I know you because I know that you listen to this podcast because you are interested in lots of things. And because of that, you are also very interesting, by the way. I don't know if I've told you that recently, but you are. And so I was thinking, hmm, it is time. It is time to switch things up. And honestly, part of what brought me to that conclusion is that I have not been able to knit a stitch since early April this year. It is now November 21st. 
that's a long time for me to not have really picked up the needles. I knit 16 stitches at one point. That was as far as I could go. Some of that was because we moved three times in two months, something I do not recommend doing ever. Please don't do what I do. And my neck and shoulders really truly have not recovered from the strain of that. Instead, something else happened. And those of you who listen to North and South, you know this bit. When we were unpacking in our new place in New Hope, Pennsylvania, I pulled out a quilt. It was a quilt that had been given to me by my elderly babysitter. She was my babysitter when I was very young, like birth to seven. And she was older then. And then we stayed in touch with her until until she died. And when she passed away, she left me things, which was extraordinary, I thought. And one of those things that she left me was a very pretty, very simple handmade quilt. All of the stitching, all of the stitching was hand done. And there was an enormous rip in it. I didn't want this to be a museum quality quilt. I did not want this to hang behind glass mounted upon acid-free paper. I wanted this to be a usable quilt, something that I or my children could sleep under. And so I needed the mend that I was about to attack to be hardy and as close to invisible as possible. Because Craftlet listeners are extraordinary and wonderful people, I got so much information sent to me about different things to take into consideration as I was attempting to mend this quilt on my own, <laughs> not not being much of an embroiderer or hand sewer at all, which means to me I was facing a dangerous obstacle. But there was such a wealth of information and needles sent to me and fabric sent to me and spools sent to me and other spools that I was warned away from. Like if you have antique wooden spools, really not such a good idea to use that thread on that antique wooden spool to mend something because that thread on that wooden spool is probably on its way out <laughs> and it won't be so good in a mend. So I mended that quilt and it was all fantastic and wonderful. And then I pulled out another quilt. It had disintegrated even more. I mean, really, the batting was showing everywhere. And it was very frustrating because it was a, a hexagon quilt. And I thought, well, shoot, how am I going to do this? I'm going to have to applique hundreds of little, little hexagons all over this thing. I don't know how to do that. I don't want to do that. And I can't do it by machine because this was also a handmade quilt. And then I stumbled across a book. It was called Quilting on the Go. And the technique that was used in this book is called English paper piecing. And once I started fiddling around with this whole concept, I discovered that it was A, very portable, which is one of the things that I'd liked about knitting. B, very easy to pick up and put down. There is no losing your place when you're doing English paper piecing. And C, there was already a zeitgeist going on. Sister Diane over at Crafty Pod, she has a book coming out on English paper piecing. So we will talk to her later and find out how she stumbled into this and, and what it is that she's been up to with her paper piecing. But that also got me thinking about quilting in general. And for the longest time, I've stayed away from quilting because, because it seemed like as big a gear hoe as I can be, and we know I can be, it seemed to me that the requirements for quilting were so vast and expensive that I was never going to even bother to try and attempt doing something like that. And then there was the other side of it, which is it can get a little more precious than I want to have the things that I make be. I want my quilts to look a little more modern and interesting. And I find it challenging to combine colors in ways like that and patterns at the same time. So I'm not, I'm not all that good at it and I'm not very practiced at it. And then my brother-in-law married a really spectacular woman and Katie is a master quilter. She's also one of those perfect people who can be out in 170,000 degree weather and still look gorgeous. And if she wasn't as wonderful as she is, I would have a problem. But I contacted her earlier this week to find out if I would be able to interview her for the podcast so I could share some of a master's viewpoints on quilting and how to start and what's required, what's really honestly required. You know, can you do it with just a needle and thread? 
I don't know, English paper piecing, you can regular quilting, the kind of quilting that requires patterns. I don't know. I haven't talked to her about it yet. But I will be sharing that interview with you. I'll also be talking to Sister Diane at some point in the near future about her book. And so for a few weeks, we'll talk about quilting. And I'll share what I find with you. And then we'll talk about something else. Also, for those of you who are new, we have a call-in line. What does that mean? That means that we have a phone number. It goes like this. 206-350-1642. And if you call that phone number, it will allow you to leave a voicemail message. That can be a message about the crafty content, something that I said that you wanted to respond to, things you noticed in the book that I didn't mention or didn't mention yet, or even disagreeing with me about something that I said about the book. I think that's some of the most interesting conversations that we've had on the podcast are when people have called in and said, "Mm, maybe not so much. I kind of thought of it this way, because that's, you know, that's the book club part. And before we got the phone number, it was a little more challenging. You had to email and I would have to read your email and and then you're just listening to me the whole time. It's a lot more fabulous to have you guys call in. So again, 1-206-350-1642. Now, if you're listening on the CraftLit app that is available for iOS devices, Android devices, and Windows 8 devices, you will find that on the contact little menu thingy that you can tap, one of the choices is to call the show. And so that's very easy if you are listening on a phone. You'll also see the phone number listed in the sidebar of the show notes at craftlit.com. And if you are a premium audio member, you can get the phone number also at craftlit.libsyn.com dot com slash podcast. And that's actually a very important URL in general, because if anything happens to go wrong with the iTunes feed or craftlit.com, and it's Friday and it's five o'clock and you know that an episode is supposed to be up and why isn't it on iTunes, go to one of those other locations because chances are iTunes is having a problem but the podcast is waiting for you at craftlit.libsyn.com slash podcast or on one of the smart device apps. And all of these URLs that I'm talking about can be found at the top of the show notes for easy reference. Now I mentioned premium audio. I will talk about that a little bit more at the end of the show. We'll hang on to that one for a little while. We'll, We'll table that one for a moment. We have a giveaway for the rest of the month of November, because we had so many giveaways already this month. I started it on Thursday, and it is continuing through the end. It's the only one that's doing that. All of the other giveaways ended today, just a little bit before the show went up. And if you read the Mama Own Knits blog, then you saw a review of this book. This is the Felt So Good book. If you have never felt it before, but you've been kind of wondering, this is probably a really good book for you to try to get in the raffle. If you follow the link in the show notes, it will take you to our giveaway page where you can enter this raffle. You can enter every day if you want, multiple times, and get a chance to win this fabulous book. The little widget that you will punch into to say that you are entering the raffle will contact you randomly at the end of the raffle, and that's how you'll know if you're a winner. Or you can go back on December 1st and see whose name is listed at that little widget. It'll tell you who won. But I did have a few other things that people have sent in that they wanted to share with you. One of those is Anna Campos at Toil and Trouble Yarns. She is running a retreat. This is the Lakeside Fiber Retreat. It is a casual retreat for knitters, and it will take place by Purity Lake in New Hampshire on May 1st through 3rd, ooh, almost my birthday, in 2015, which sounds like it's such a long way off, but really, really it's not. Pre-registration for this retreat is ongoing, and the registration will open officially January 1st, 2015. Classes will include, but are not limited to, Japanese crochet motif, colorwork knitting, steaking, spinning, and knitting the perfect sweater. The retreat is very close to being sold out, so if you are interested, please visit the show notes and look for the link to the Lakeside Fiber Retreat. 
You can also go to Anna's website, toilandtrouble.com, which is toil-and-trouble.com, and you can find the retreat information there as well. We have another listener who has another retreat. This one is coming at you from Varian. This is the Canuga Netting and Quilting Retreat. This is coming up very soon. This is January 15th through January 18th of 2015. This is a three-day retreat in the North Carolina mountains, right? I know it's going to be beautiful and it's going to be cold. There will be projects for knitters and quilters, or you can bring your own project. Think big stone fireplaces and lots of laughter and new and old friends. This is a time for you to relax after the holidays, kick back, be at one with your crafting and a fireplace. Uh, projects that will be going on there are knitting projects the dream bird shawl knitted toys beginning socks leftover wrap fixing mistakes and sticking basics quilting projects will include a log cabin cross and asian fusion wall hanging and a jelly roll race and carousel quilts included in the price will be your accommodation and meals and the classes some fees for materials will apply but mostly you bring your own stuff and work out of your stash So casual, relaxed, after the holidays, not such a bad thing. That's January 15th through January 18th. There is an optional January 19th stay over. So if you wanted to add an extra night, you can. And you can go to www.canuga.org slash KKQ. That is Canuga, K-A-N-U-G-A. And then KKQ for Canuga Knitters and Quilters. So, fun stuff. Along those same lines, did you have fun with all of the giveaways that we had earlier this week to celebrate the start of Herland? I hope so. And I hope that you signed up for the newsletters. There were a couple of newsletters. There's the Craftlet newsletter, and there's also the Craftlet travel newsletter, just in case. Just in case you're interested in the fact that we're currently putting the finishing touches on a craft lit tour to Yorkshire and the English Lake District for next year, for 2015. Yay! So if you sign up for the newsletter, you'll be one of the first people to get all of the details for our brand new 2015 craft lit tour to the UK. I can't wait to be able to share the details with you. It's going to be so much fun. And, uh, and so I should have more information on that very soon. But make sure you sign up for the newsletter so you find out right away. That sign-up link is also in the show notes at craftlit.com. Herland. Herland is going to be a very different book for us than what we've done in the past. In fact, the only book that I can think of that comes close to... Close to how different this book is, is Flatland. Because Flatland was a very different book, too. Not that Herland is going to have any, you know, geometry that you need to draw while you're listening. But it is it is a very different kind of book. It is nothing like Jane Eyre or Pride and Prejudice or Dracula or The Woman in White. It's not even anything like The Age of Innocence which was written after Herland. Charlotte Perkins Gilman was an interesting woman, just in general. And there's a lot more information about her now than there was when I first read Herland. I've even found more information than I found when we were doing The Yellow Wallpaper way back in 2006. The Yellow Wallpaper is definitely the thing that she is the most famous for. That is a a rather long short story about a woman who is suffering from what we would now call postpartum depression and has been told that instead of trying to engage herself in daily activities or pleasurable pursuits or anything like that in order to try and overcome the depression that she was stuck in, this woman's doctor, who unfortunately is her husband, basically locks her in an attic room and tells her to stay there and doesn't give her any books or any paper or anything like that. And so all she has to look at is this ghastly yellow wallpaper. And then she notices the the bed is bolted to the floor and it's just, 
everything about the room is creepy and she she goes nuts. Well, she wrote this short story for a reason, because that's what happened to her after she had her, her daughter, her only child. Not that she went nuts necessarily, but that she had a horrible, horrible wrestling match with postpartum depression. And whether that directly led to her separation and eventual divorce from her husband, I'm not entirely sure, but it didn't help them any. And she's a, she's a fairly interesting woman also in that when he remarried, she said, oh, good. I'm, I'm so glad he's happy. And I'm so glad that my daughter has yet another mother who can care for her as well. So, you know, her daughter would spend time with her dad and stepmom and time with Charlotte Perkins Gilman. And Gilman seems to have been really pretty cool with that, which I found very interesting because that's not the typical picture that we are given of mothers and shared child rearing. But that is going to come into play as we get into her land. Gilman was born July 3rd, 1860. So that puts her, I think that is the year that Wilkie Collins wrote and published The Woman in White. So you have Charlotte Perkins Gilman being born then, but by the time she writes Herland, I think she's already 55. She wrote it in 1915. And she, she lived until 1935. So she was 75 when she died. That's a, that's a good long track record. And there were, there were lots of things about her that I had kind of assumed when I read Herland at university. I actually read this book as part of a science fiction literature class, which I find very odd. And of all of the books that we read in that class, this was by far my favorite. In reading it again as an adult, I can see why I was so taken with it when I was younger. And I still think it's a very important book for lots and lots of reasons. But it is definitely of its time. And Gilman has a very particular viewpoint that she is espousing. And it's one that I find interesting because growing up in 1860, she would have started to come of age right on the cusp of uh, the Gilded Age. The Gilded Age in the United States lasted from about 1870 to 1900. And Mark Twain is actually the one who started the term the Gilded Age. He was using the term to satirize an era of serious social problems that were being masked by a thin layer of gold gilding. So it was the rise of the robber barons and, and all of the, you know, there were, there were no unions, there were no protections for the workers. It's, it's a song that was sung in lots of other countries at the same time and even earlier than the United States. So that's when Charlotte Perkins Gilman was growing up and becoming a, a grown-up <laughs> was in the middle of all of that. So the rise of industry and the robber barons and uh, the rise of yellow journalism and yellow journalism, it's a kind of journalism that doesn't even pretend to present itself as researched or having any kind of fact necessarily based behind what it's saying. It was really just a way to sell newspapers. It was making the the titles kind of blaring. And it's what we see these days in tabloids. But yellow yellow journalism was pretty much all the newspapers participated in it. But this this all started in the 1890s. It was referring to the yellow ink that was being used in a war between Pulitzer's New York World and William Randolph Hearst's The New York Journal. And so they, they're, you know, using special colored ink to try and attract attention and screaming headlines and nothing particularly legitimate. All they're trying to do is sell papers, people. Nothing to see here. I think we see it probably more on cable news these days than we do in, in anything else, at least here in the States we do. So Gilman, so there were a lot of things that she was reacting against, or at least a lot of things that philosophically she was reacting against. The treatment of women, the disenfranchisement of women, their inability to vote, because 1915 in the United States, women still could not vote, not until 1920. And she grew up extremely poor. Her father abandoned her mother and 
her siblings. So they moved around between aunts and different households. She was related to Harriet Beecher Stowe. Her mother was a, a relative of the Beechers. And so she had some interesting family members, extended family members, Harriet Beecher Stowe being the one who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. The story is marvelous, although I think I read somewhere that it's apocryphal that when President Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe, who was about knee-high to a grasshopper, she was really tiny, he said, so this is the little woman who started the Great War? I don't think that's actually true, but it's a great story. So so there, I just passed it on again and perpetuated a a myth right here on the podcast in front of everyone. But having grown up poor, Gilman, she was going to have a definite viewpoint about income and economy and being raised by not only a mother, but by a family of very strong women. She was going to have attitudes about women in general as well. And I think it's fair to say that if you have grown up surrounded by women who are perfectly, perfectly competent at taking care of themselves and doing everything for themselves because because the men took off, I don't think it would be very hard for you to say, yeah, men, yeah, I don't know why we need them. They don't do anything. All of that said, for, for the men in the audience who are listening and going, oh man, what have I gotten myself into? I do want to say this up front. She does not hate men. She does not hate men. She was happily married, eventually, ultimately, happily married for a good long time and was a very proud feminist, a sociologist, a novelist. Uh, She wrote short stories. She wrote nonfiction. She was a big social reformer. That was really where she was most comfortable. But she was not a man-hater at all. And it makes it really interesting because feminism during my lifetime went from Gloria Steinem and Ms. Magazine and women's empowerment and all of that into feminism being a bad word. And we've talked about this before on the podcast, although it was quite a long time ago, when I think it was when we were doing Jane Austen and there was all the, the chick lit stuff that was coming out and people were talking about recategorizing things like Pride and Prejudice as chick lit. And I think as we saw with Pride and Prejudice back eight and a half years ago, to dismiss Jane Austen as just mere entertainment or the pulp of its day, instead of looking at the Castle of Otranto or something else, is kind of missing the important social commentary that Jane Austen was doing. And in many ways, promoting a a feminist vision of the women at that time. I mean, as much of a feminist as you could be, Elizabeth Bennet, she spoke her mind. That's pretty awesome (laughs) for, for back then. By the time Gilman comes along, there's a huge groundswell of women fighting for the right to vote. And you have the Seneca Falls Convention and you have uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and you have Susan B. Anthony, who are very, very forceful and loud in their arguments. Gilman was actually a little quieter and she liked satire. In fact, she wrote a poem that I found hysterical, which I will read for you later on during the during the course of the book. And the poem is definitely related to the themes of her land, but, but funnier. And that's the other reason why I don't want the men to worry about reading this book. It is funny. It has its moments. It's not funny, ha ha, it's funny, uh, that kind of funny. Well, I guess there are a couple moments where I actually did laugh out loud. But it is not as clearly defined a satire as Gulliver's Travels was. Although you will notice some very important parallels to Gulliver's Travels, I think. And I don't think those are there accidentally. I think she knew exactly what she was doing. And I think she knew that if she wanted to get her point across and get it across to men, the best way to do that was to make sure that the people telling the story in the book Herland were the men. And so we follow the story as told by one of three men. And she sets them up pretty much as archetypes. So Jeff Margrave, the Southern gentleman, he's a botanist and a doctor who puts women on a pedestal. And that's not a good place for anybody to be put. Let's be honest. That's just, that's just asking for trouble. You've got the main character whose story, whose version of the story, whose vision of the story we follow. And his name is Van, Van Dyke Jennings. 
and Van Dyke Jennings is the sociologist of the group. They're all scientifically minded, all of the three men. But he's the sociologist, and he's the one who probably has the most balanced view of the women, which will make it all the more shocking when he has unbalanced views of other groups of people, which we'll talk about shortly. And then you have Terry Nicholson, who is kind of a pushy, rich, kind of Tom from Gatsby or the Long Island Lockjaw, Muffy kind of guy, kind of a pig is where we're going with that. And so she, she sets them up kind of as archetypes. I mean, they are three distinct, different attitudes towards women, about women. They see the world fundamentally differently from each other. But the, one of the things that keeps them together as friends is their love of adventure, their desire to be explorers and go and find new things. They are interested in lots of things, and they come from a fairly scientifically minded position in their, their own little scientific world. And Terry is rich. So that's a good reason to stick with Terry. <laughs> I, when I graduated from university, a friend lived on a boat. And so we would go sailing every Sunday because, hey, what else are you going to do? And then I had another friend after I graduated who was a pilot. He was a helicopter pilot and a small plane pilot. And so he took me flying because that's awesome. That's so much fun. And I remember my dad and I were talking at some point and I told him, you know, hey, we you know, went out on the boat and then I'm going to go flying. And he said, I'm really proud of you. These are the kinds of friendships you should cultivate. Keep, keep doing that. Keep this up. That's good. And I should mention my dad, not only because of that, but also because he is the one who's going to be reading this book to you, which is cool because not only does he have a voice that I have a very easy time listening to, and I think you will as well, but he is the father of two daughters, two, how you say, headstrong, <laughs> opinionated daughters. I'm sure other people have described us other ways that are less flattering, but I'll just, I'll just stick with strong, strong-minded, strong-willed daughters. So he's certainly had to see women from perhaps a different point of view than he might have done when he was growing up and a kid. Although I certainly didn't ever see any struggle. He was and is a great dad who has never made me feel like there was anything I couldn't do if I just set my mind to it and worked hard. So that's pretty good, right? I think so. So Gilman had postpartum depression it led to the breakup of her first marriage, which was fairly rare at the time. She moved out to California, to Pasadena, California, in the late 1880s, which is, which is, wow, wow. My family was already there when she got there. And I know how desert-y it was back then. So she, she got to Pasadena before there was a Rose Bowl, is what I'm saying. And she became very active in several feminist and reformist groups when she was out in California. And then she and her husband kind of took turns with her daughter. She'd stay with Charlotte Perkins Gilman for a while, and then she'd go back and stay with her dad and her new mother, her stepmother. Her first husband's name was Charles Walter Stetson. So she was Charlotte Perkins Stetson Gilman, which you will see her referred to as occasionally, but mostly she's just Charlotte Perkins Gilman. And then in 1893, she goes back to the East Coast and she contacts Houghton Gilman. Houghton Gilman was her first cousin and they were fast friends. They met up again in 1893 and in 1900 they married and they stayed married until 1934 when he died suddenly and surprisingly from a cerebral hemorrhage. In 1932, after this long and happy marriage, and shortly before her husband died, she was diagnosed with incurable breast cancer. She lasted until 1935, at which point she took an overdose of chloroform. And in her suicide note, she wrote that she chose chloroform over cancer. She was allowed to die quickly and quietly, with dignity, and in no pain. Knowing all of that, you will find some of the things that she espouses in her book to be quite surprising. And probably not at all what you will have expected by the time we get there. 
She's a very interesting woman and a tricky one to pigeonhole. And I will do my best not to pigeonhole her as we read. This first chapter, not surprisingly, introduces us to our characters, the three guys, and introduces us to how they find out about this strange woman country. So we begin at the beginning with the men, and we'll get closer and closer to actually being in and seeing her land as we continue through the book. I'm really, really excited that you're here to share this book with me. I cannot wait to hear what you have to say. Don't forget, 206-350-1642. And here we go with chapter one of Her Land. Her Land by Charlotte Perkins Stetson Gilman. Chapter One, A Not Unnatural Enterprise. This is written from memory, unfortunately. If I could have brought with me the material I so carefully prepared, this would be a very different story. Whole books full of notes, carefully copied records, first-hand descriptions, and the pictures. That's the worst loss. We had some bird's eyes of the cities and parks, a lot of lovely views of streets, of buildings outside and in, and some of those gorgeous gardens, and most important of all, of the women themselves. Nobody will ever believe how they looked. Descriptions aren't any good when it comes to women, and I never was good at descriptions anyhow. But it's got to be done somehow. The rest of the world needs to know about that country. I haven't said where it is for fear some self-appointed missionaries or traders or land-greedy expansionists will take it upon themselves to push in. They will not be wanted, I can tell you that, and will fare worse than we did if they do find it. It began this way. There were three of us, classmates and friends. Terry O. Nicholson, we used to call him the old Nick, with good reason. Jeff Margrave and I, Van Dyke Jennings. We had known each other years and years, and in spite of our differences, we had a good deal in common. All of us were interested in science. Terry was rich enough to do as he pleased. His great aim was exploration. He used to make all kinds of a row because there was nothing left to explore now, only patchwork and filling in, he said. He filled in well enough. He had a lot of talents. Great on mechanics and electricity, had all kinds of boats and motor cars, and was one of the best of our airmen. We never could have done the thing at all without Terry. Jeff Margrave was born to be a poet a botanist, or both, but his folks persuaded him to be a doctor instead. He was a good one for his age, but his real interest was in what he loved to call the wonders of science. As for me, sociology's my major. You have to back that up with a lot of other sciences, of course. I'm interested in them all. Terry was strong on facts, geography and meteorology and those. Jeff could beat him any time on biology and I didn't care what it was they talked about, so long as it connected with human life somehow. There are few things that don't. We three had a chance to join a big scientific expedition. They needed a doctor, and that gave Jeff an excuse for dropping his just-opening practice. They needed Terry's experience, his machine, and his money. And as for me, I got in through Terry's influence. The expedition was up among the thousand tributaries and enormous hinterland of a great river, up where the maps had to be made, savage dialects studied, and all manner of strange flora and fauna expected. But this story is not about that expedition. That was only the mere starter for ours. My interest was first roused by talk among our guides. I'm quick at languages, know a good many, and pick them up readily. What with that and a really good interpreter we took with us, I made out quite a few legends and folk myths of these scattered tribes. And as we got farther and farther upstream, in a dark tangle of rivers, lakes, morasses, and dense forests with here and there an unexpected long spur running out from the big mountains beyond, I noticed that more and more of these savages had a story about a strange and terrible woman land in the high distance. Up yonder, over there, way up, 
was all the direction they could offer, but their legends all agreed on the main point, that there was this strange country where no men lived, only women and girl children. None of them had ever seen it. It was dangerous, deadly, they said, for any man to go there. But there were tales of long ago when some brave investigator had seen it, a big country, big houses, plenty people, all women. Had no one else gone? Yes, a good many, but they never came back. It was no place for men. Of that, they seemed sure. I told the boys about these stories, and they laughed at them. Naturally, I did myself. I knew the stuff that savage dreams are made of. But when we had reached our farthest point, just the day before we all had to turn around and start for home again, as the best of expeditions must in time, we three made a discovery. The main encampment was on a spit of land running out into the main stream, or what we thought was the main stream. It had the same muddy color we had been seeing for weeks past, the same taste. I happened to speak of that river to our last guide, a rather superior fellow with quick, bright eyes. He told me that there was another river. Over there, short river, sweet water, red and blue. I was interested in this and anxious to see if I had understood. So I showed him a red and a blue pencil I carried and asked again. Yes, he pointed to the river and then to the southwestward. River, good water, red and blue. Terry was close by and interested in the fellow's pointing. What does he say, Van? I told him. Terry blazed up at once. Ask him how far it is. The man indicated a short journey. I judged about two hours, maybe three. Let's go, urged Terry. Just us three. Maybe we can really find something. Maybe cinnabar in it. Maybe indigo, Jeff suggested with his lazy smile. It was early yet. We had just breakfasted and leaving word that we'd be back before night. We got away quietly, not wishing to be thought too gullible if we failed, and secretly hoping to have some nice little discovery all to ourselves. It was a long two hours, nearer three. I fancy the savage could have done it alone much quicker. There was a desperate tangle of wood and water and a swampy patch we never should have found our way across alone. But there was one, and I could see Terry with compass and notebook marking directions and trying to place landmarks. We came after a while to a sort of marshy lake, very big, so that the circling forest looked quite low and dim across it. Our guide told us that boats could go from there to our camp, but... Long way, all day. This water was somewhat clearer than that we had left, but we could not judge well from the margin. We skirted it for another half hour or so, the ground growing firmer as we advanced, and presently we turned the corner of a wooded promontory and saw a quite different country. A sudden view of mountains, steep and bare. One of those long easterly spurs, said Terry appraisingly. Maybe hundreds of miles from the range. They crop out like that. Suddenly, we left the lake and struck directly towards the cliffs. We heard running water before we reached it, and the guide pointed proudly to his river. It was short. We could see where it poured down a narrow vertical cataract from an opening in the face of the cliff. It was sweet water. The guide drank eagerly, and so did we. That's snow water, Terry announced. Must come from way back in the hills. But as to being red and blue, it was greenish in tent. The guide seemed not at all surprised. He hunted about a little and showed us a quiet marginal pool where there were smears of red along the border. Yes, and of blue. Terry got out his magnifying glass and squatted down to investigate. Chemicals of some sort. I can't tell on the spot. Look to me like dye stuff. Let's get nearer, he urged. Up there by the fall. We scrambled along the steep banks and got close to the pool that foamed and boiled beneath the falling water. Here we searched the border and found traces of color beyond dispute. More. Jeff suddenly held up an unlooked-for trophy. It was only a rag, a long, raveled fragment of cloth, but it was a well-woven fabric with a pattern, 
and of a clear scarlet that the water had not faded. No savage tribe that we had heard of made such fabrics. The guide stood serenely on the bank, well pleased with our excitement. One day blue, one day red, one day green, he told us, and pulled from his pouch another strip of bright-hued cloth. Come down, he said, pointing to the cataract. Woman country, up there. Then we were interested. We had our rest and lunch right there and pumped the man for further information. He could tell us only what the others had, a land of women, no men, babies, but all girls. No place for men. Dangerous. Some had gone to sea. None had come back. I could see Terry's jaw set at that. No place for men? Dangerous? He looked as if he might shin up the waterfall on the spot, but the guide would not hear of going up, even if there had been any possible method of scaling that sheer cliff, and we had to get back to our party before night. They might stay if we told them, I suggested. But Terry stopped in his tracks. Look here, fellows, he said. This is our find. Let's not tell those cocky old professors. Let's go on home with them, and then come back. Just us. Have a little expedition of our own. We looked at him, much impressed. There was something attractive to a bunch of unattached young men in finding an undiscovered country of a strictly Amazonian nature. Of course, we didn't believe the story, but yet... There is no such cloth made by any of these local tribes, I announced, examining those rags with great care. Somewhere up yonder they spin and weave and dye, as well as we do. That would mean a considerable civilization, Van. There couldn't be such a place and not known about. Oh, well, I don't know. What's that old republic up in the Pyrenees somewhere? Andorra? Precious few people know anything about that, and it's been minding its own business for a thousand years. Then there's Montenegro, splendid little state. You could lose a dozen Montenegros up and down these great ranges. We discussed it hotly all the way back to camp. We discussed it with care and privacy on the voyage home. We discussed it after that, still only among ourselves, while Terry was making arrangements. He was hot about it. Lucky he had so much money. We might have had to beg and advertise for years to start the thing and then it would have been a matter of public amusement. Just sport for the papers. But T.O. Nicholson could fix up his big steam yacht, load his specially made big motorboat aboard, and tuck in a disassembled biplane without any more notice than a snip in the society column. We had provisions and preventatives and all manner of supplies. His previous experience stood him in good stead there, it was a very complete little outfit. We were to leave the yacht at the nearest safe port and go up that endless river in our motorboat, just the three of us and a pilot, then drop the pilot when we got to that last stopping place of the previous party and hunt up that clear water stream ourselves. The motorboat we were going to leave at anchor in that wide shallow lake. It had a special covering of fitted armor, thin but strong, shut up like a clamshell. Those natives can't get in it, or hurt it, or move it, Terry explained proudly. We'll start our flyer on the lake and leave the boat as a base to come back to. If we come back, I suggested cheerfully. Afraid the ladies will eat you, he scoffed. We're not so sure about those ladies, you know, drawled Jeff. There may be a contingent of gentlemen with poisoned arrows or something. Go? You'll have to get an injunction to stop me, both Jeff and I were sure about that. But we did have differences of opinion all the long way. An ocean voyage is an excellent time for discussion. Now we had no eavesdroppers, we could loll and loaf in our deck chairs and talk and talk. There was nothing else to do. Our absolute lack of facts only made the field of discussion wider. We'll leave papers with our consul where the yacht stays, Terry planned. If we don't come back in, say, a month... They can send a relief party after us. A punitive expedition, I urged. If the ladies do eat us, we must make reprisals. They can locate that last stopping place easy enough, and I've made a sort of chart of that lake and that cliff and waterfall. Yeah, but how will they get up? asked Jeff. Same way we do, of course. If three valuable American citizens are lost up there, they will follow somehow. 
to say nothing of the glittering attractions of that fair land. Let's call it Feminesia, he broke off. You're right, Terry. Once the story gets out, the river will crawl with expeditions and the airships rise like a swarm of mosquitoes, I laughed as I thought of it. We've made a great mistake not to let Mr. Yellow Press in on this. Save us. What headlines? Not much, said Terry grimly. This is our party. We're going to find that place alone. What are you going to do with it when you do find it? If you do, Jeff asked mildly. Jeff was a tender soul. I think he thought that country, if there was one, was just blossoming with roses and babies and canaries and tidies and all that sort of thing. And Terry, in his secret heart, had visions of a sort of sublimated summer resort. Just girls and girls and girls. And that he was going to be, well, Terry was popular among women even when there were other men around, and it's not to be wondered at that he had pleasant dreams of what might happen. I could see it in his eyes as he lay there, looking at the long blue roller slipping by and fingering that impressive mustache of his. But I thought then that I could form a far clearer idea of what was before us than either of them. You're all off, boys, I insisted. If there is such a place and there does seem some foundation for believing it. You'll find it's built on a sort of matriarchal principle, that's all. The men have a separate cult of their own, less socially developed than the women, and make them an annual visit, a sort of uh, wedding call. This is a condition known to have existed. Here's just a survival. You've got some peculiarly isolated valley or tableland up there, and their primeval customs have survived. That's all there is to it. How about the boys? Jeff asked. Oh, the men take them away as soon as they are five or six, you see. And how about this danger theory all our guides are so sure of? Danger enough, Terry, and we'll have to be mighty careful. Women of that stage of culture are quite able to defend themselves and have no welcome for unseasonable visitors. We talked and talked. And with all my airs of sociological superiority, I was no nearer than any of them. It was funny, though, and in light of what we did find, those extremely clear ideas of ours as to what a country of women would be like. It was no use to tell ourselves and one another that all this was idle speculation. We were idle, and we did speculate, on the ocean voyage and the river voyage, too. Admitting the improbability we'd begin solemnly and then launch out again. They would fight among themselves, Terry insisted. Women always do. We mustn't look to find any sort of order and organization. You did wrong, Jeff told him. It'll be like a nunnery under an abbess, a peaceful, harmonious sisterhood. I snorted derision at the idea. Nuns, indeed. Your peaceful sisterhoods were all celibate, Jeff, and under vows of obedience. These are just women and mothers, and where there's motherhood, you don't find sisterhood. Not much. No, sir, they'll scrap, agreed Terry. Also, we mustn't look for inventions and progress. It'll be awfully primitive. How about that uh, cloth mill, Jeff suggested. Oh, cloth. Women have always been spinsters, but there they stop. You'll see. We joked Terry about his modest impression that he would be warmly received, but he held his ground. You'll see, he insisted. I'll get solid with them all and play one bunch against another. I'll get myself elected king in no time. Whew! Solomon to take a back seat. Where do you come on with that idea, I demanded. Aren't we viziers or anything? Couldn't risk it, he asserted solemnly. You might start a revolution. Probably would. No, you'll have to be headed or bowstrung, or whatever the popular method of execution is. You'll have to do it yourself, remember, grinned Jeff. No husky black slaves and mamelukes, and there'd be two of us and only one of you, eh, Van? Jeff's idea and Terry's were so far apart that sometimes it was all I could do to keep the peace between them. Jeff idealized women in the best southern style. He was full of chivalry and sentiment and all that. And he was a good boy. He lived up to his ideals. 
You might say Terry did too, if you can call his views about women anything so polite as ideals. I always liked Terry. He was a man's man, very much so, generous and brave and clever. But I don't think any of us in our college days was quite pleased to have him with our sisters. We weren't very stringent, heavens no, but Terry was the limit. Later on, why, of course, a man's life is his own, we held, and asked no questions. But barring a possible exception in favor of a not impossible wife, or of his mother, or, of course, the fair relatives of his friends, Terry's idea seemed to be that pretty women were just so much game and homely ones not worth considering. It was really unpleasant sometimes to see the notions he had. But I got out of patience with Jeff, too. He had such rose-colored halos on his womenfolk. I held a middle ground, highly scientific, of course, and used to argue learnedly about the physiological limitations of the sex. We were not the least advanced on the woman question, any of us, then. So we joked and disputed and speculated, and after an interminable journey, we got to our old camping place at last. It was not hard to find the river, just poking along the side until we came to it, and it was navigable as far as the lake. When we reached that and slid out on its broad, glistening bosom, with the high gray promontory running out toward us, and the straight white fall clearly visible, it began to be really exciting. There was some talk, even then, of skirting the rock wall and seeking a possible footway up, but the marshy jungle made that method look not only difficult, but dangerous. Terry dismissed the plan sharply. Nonsense, fellows. We've decided that. It might take months. We haven't got the provisions. No, sir. We've got to take our chances. If we don't, why, we're not the first explorers to get lost in the shuffle. There are plenty to come after us. So we got the big biplane together and loaded it with our scientifically compressed baggage. The camera, of course. The glasses. A supply of concentrated food. Our pockets were magazines of small necessities, and we had our guns, of course. There was no knowing what might happen. Up and up and up we sailed, way up at first, to get the lay of the land and make note of it. Out of that dark green sea of crowding forest, this high-standing spur rose steeply. It ran back on either side, apparently, to the far-off white-crowned peaks in the distance, themselves probably inaccessible. Let's make the first trip geographical, I suggested. Spy out the land and drop back here for more gasoline. With your tremendous speed, we can reach that range and back all right. Then we can leave a sort of map on board for that relief expedition. There's sense in that, Terry agreed. I'll put off being king of Lady Land for one more day. So we made a long skirting voyage, turned the point of the cape, which was close by, ran up one side of the triangle at our best speed, crossed over the base where it left the higher mountains, and so back to our lake by moonlight. That's not a bad little kingdom, we agreed, when it was roughly drawn and measured. We could tell the size fairly by our speed, and from what we could see of the sides and that icy ridge at the back end, it's a pretty enterprising savage who would manage to get into that, Jeff said. Of course we had looked at the land itself eagerly, but we were too high and going too fast to see much. It appeared to be well forested about the edges, but in the interior there were wide plains and uh, everywhere park-like meadows and open places. There were cities, too. That, I insisted. It looked, well, it looked like any other country, a civilized one, I mean. We had to sleep after that long sweep through the air, but we turned out early enough next day, and again we rose softly up the height till we could top the crowning trees and see the broad fair land at our pleasure. Semi-tropical. Looks like a first-rate climate. It's wonderful what a little height will do for temperature, Terry was studying the forest growth. Little height? Is that what you call little? I asked. Our instruments measured it clearly. We had not realized the long, gentle rise from the coast, perhaps. Mighty lucky piece of land, I call it, Terry pursued. Now for the folks. I've had enough scenery. So we sailed low, crossing back and forth, quartering the country as we went, and studying it. 
we saw, I can't remember now how much of this we noted then and how much was supplemented by our later knowledge, but we could not help seeing this much, even on that excited day, a land in a state of perfect cultivation, where even the as if they were cared for, a land that looked like an enormous park, only it was even more evidently an enormous garden. I don't see any cattle, I suggested, but Terry was silent. We were approaching a village. I confess that we paid small attention to the clean, well-built roads, to the attractive architecture, to the ordered beauty of the little town. We had our glasses out. Even Terry, setting his machine for a spiral glide, clapped the binoculars to his eyes. They heard our whirring screw. They ran out of the houses. They gathered in from the fields, swift-running light figures, crowds of them. We stared and stared until it was almost too late to catch the levers, sweep off and rise again, and then we held our peace for a long run upward. Gosh, said Terry after a while. Only women there, children, Jeff urged excitedly. But they looked, why, this is a civilized country, I protested. There must be men. Of course there are men, said Terry. Come on, let's find them. He refused to listen to Jeff's suggestion that we examine the country further before we risk leaving our machine. There's a fine landing place right there where we came over, he insisted. And it was an excellent one, a wide, flat-topped rock overlooking the lake and quite out of sight from the interior. They won't find this in a hurry, he asserted as we scrambled with the utmost difficulty down to safer footing. Come on, boys. There were some good lookers in that bunch. Of course, it was unwise of us. It was quite easy to see afterward that our best plan was to have studied the country more fully before we left our swooping airship and trusted ourselves to mere foot service. But we were three young men. We had been talking about this country for over a year, hardly believing that there was such a place, and now we were in it. It looked safe and civilized enough, and among those upturned, crowding faces, though some were terrified enough, there was a great beauty. On that, we all agreed. Come on, cried Terry, pushing forward. Oh, come on. Here goes for her land. So, her land. Let's talk. The book was written in 1915, so World War I had already begun. We had cars, we had planes, and we certainly had newspapers. <laughs> there are many utopian books that have been written over the ages. I mean, going back to Plato's Republic, if you want, but there have been lots. Thomas More's Utopia. Utopian fantasies are not new, but they kind of, it would have, it would have been a challenge to write one after World War I had started, which makes Herland a really interesting book to appear in that time. But there was something else about Herland. The yellow wallpaper survived pretty much intact. I saw it excerpted in older books, not often, not as often as it is now. But Herland went away. Herland went away. It was the middle part of a trilogy, which we'll talk more about later. And the same thing happened to it that happened to Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God. It just disappeared. And it was revived in the 70s. And so there are generations of women who had no idea that this book existed. Generations of women and men who had no idea this book existed. And it's a shame because it'd be very interesting to see how this book would have been read in the 50s. I would have been very, very curious. But then there's um, Johnny Got His Gun that Dalton Trumbo wrote, and it's the same thing. It just disappeared. It was an anti-war book, and it, it just disappeared until Vietnam. But just like Jonathan Swift, Part of what Gilman does that is so brilliant is she pokes fun at everyone, and especially at society. She does an incredible job of pointing out the logical fallacies under which we live our lives every single day. And it's marvelously done because it makes you smile, it makes you laugh a little bit, and it makes you look at yourself and go, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm doing that. But I am. So Van, Van, who we love, and, and Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who we love, we can't be sure yet 
whose attitude this is, peeking through. But Van is pretty comfortable, (laughs) as a sociologist, calling everybody who isn't white a primitive or a savage. And I want to be really upset and angry about it, but I'm just not sure that that wasn't just standard operating procedure. I know having read a little bit about it, but also listening to a bunch of scholars around me talk about it, that the whole idea of taking uh, sociological studies of people in their native environments, interviews with people and observations and things like that, up until really quite recently, those things were always colored by the bias of the person who was watching. And they would say outrageous things. That's a whole very modern thing. So we have to wait to see how this is all going to play out, whether this is Charlotte Perkins Gilman speaking through Van or whether this is Charlotte Perkins Gilman using Van to make a point about how horrible it is to talk about other people that way. We don't know yet. So Gilman, not a man hater, has a pretty good sense of humor about things in general. Her syntax the way she constructs her sentences can be a little odd. And in fact, my dad and I were talking about this, that sometimes, I mean, you really get very tongue-tied reading some of her stuff out loud. If you read it on the page, it doesn't strike you as all that odd, but both the yellow wallpaper, which I have read out loud before, and Herland, the first three chapters of which I read for LibriVox, it's tricky stuff, it's tough, but it's fairly easy to listen to, which I found interesting. Before I'd mentioned Rime of the Ancient Mariner was another one that's really easy to read and really hard to read out loud. That one can be hard to listen to out loud as well. That rarely happens, at least for me. So it was was interesting that my dad and I both had that same reaction to Gilman's texts as well. Cinnabar. I almost forgot to tell you what cinnabar is. Cinnabar is the mineral... It's rock formation. It is a really impressive kind of crystalline rock formation. And it's how we get mercury. So it does two things. The cinnabar is bright red and it can be used to make vermilion dye, a a mineral dye. But it's also where we extract mercury from, which I thought was really weird. So that's what cinnabar is. And you can imagine that would be worth a lot of money. So that's, that's all that was. A listener sent in an email and she she got it in just, you know, missed it by that much for the end of North and South. But what she sent in is so interesting that even though we're past the North and South thing, and this won't have anything to do with her land, I thought it was probably worth reading to you. Her name is Sarah and she goes by Olympienne on Ravelry, which, if you are not a knitter, Ravelry is like Facebook for knitters. Ravelry.com. You do not have to be a knitter to sign up for this. Erin uh, Ziegler, who is the host of the Chop Bard podcast. An excellent podcast, if you haven't listened. We're about to start Twelfth Night over there. And I play one of the characters, which is very fun. Erin uh, Ziegler is not a knitter. But he has signed up on Ravelry because there is a large contingent of knitters who listen to Chop Bard podcast. And so he's hanging out with them on Ravelry. But Sarah, who is Olympian on Ravelry, writes this to all of you. I'm catching up on the latest episodes of North and South. As a 19th century literature and newspaper scholar... I know, right? What are the chances? I was particularly interested in the answers that listeners sent to your question about Captain Lennox cutting his review open and wanted to add a few commentaries to the wonderful information that they provided. In chapters 41 and 42, Gaskell shows us three distinct sorts of printed material which can relate to social classes and their respective ways of life. Captain Lennox reads, or pretends to read, A review in the drawing room of Mrs. Shaw's house in Harley Street. The word review in this particular instance refers to an old form of quarterly or monthly periodical printed in a small format, very similar to books. Thus, the need for a paper knife, which you would find as part of any writing set in a drawing room. 
Reviews were sold on subscription and were intended to be bound into volumes once or twice a year. If you were rich enough to get a subscription, you would typically want to read the current issue and then exhibit the whole bound collection on the mantelpiece of your elegant drawing room. The articles, mostly geared toward literary reviews and cultural life, reflected your political opinions. You could choose between the liberal Edinburgh Review or the more conservative Quarterly Review. Captain Lennox is deeply involved into the London social life. The review articles he read in the morning would give him in-depth views on subjects that he would discuss at dinner, thus enhancing his conversation and his social skills. As though Mr. Lennox needed any help. <laughs> in the previous chapter, Mr. Bell meets Mr. Thornton on the train to Milton. Mr. Thornton is half-hidden behind the great sheet of the outspread times, reading a daily newspaper such as the Times, of which he could have bought a copy at the railway station, is perfectly fitting to Mr. Thornton's busy life. The newspaper didn't need to be cut. It was easy to fold into a pocket and provided news on subjects relevant to the industrial preoccupations of the reader. Mr. Thornton, who just came back from a business trip to Le Havre, would find in the Times a stock market report together with the latest political and economical news. A third kind of reading material alluded to in this part of the novel is the scholarly study of books, when Mr. Bell examines Mr. Hale's books in his study. The periodicals read by Captain Lennox and Mr. Thornton, whether disposable or meant to be kept, were all directed toward instant use, whereas Mr. Hale's books are objects of study or meditation and are rooted in deep past through sacred history and the classics. They cannot be read in a drawing room or on a train, and they are typical of the intellectual class. In my opinion, these kinds of details on what and where and why the characters are reading are nearly as fascinating as the description of Mrs. Thornton's linens. I hope my small thoughts were worth sharing. And obviously, I thought they were. But isn't that interesting? I didn't understand the difference between a paper. I had assumed that the journals were kind of like magazines for us today, imminently disposable and, and something that you're going to read and share, and then eventually it's going to get recycled. But now there's a whole lot of other references to things like journals that make more sense to me because of that. Save them up and have them bound. Especially if you had the money to do it, you'd save them up and have them bound. Very interesting stuff. There is a survey link on the show notes as well. This is a demographic survey put out by Libsyn.com. Actually, that's not true. I got the link from Libsyn.com, but it's actually an advertising demographic questionnaire. So it's one of the ways that the show can support itself is by picking up advertising and sponsorships. And the easiest way to do that is through more official channels than me just kind of hanging out on a street corner saying, hey, I have this podcast. But those advertisers, those are the big guys and they need demographics. They need to know who listens and how many and what kind. And that allows them to target advertisements to us so that your time isn't wasted listening to the advertisement. Instead, you'll hear about something that might actually be useful for you instead of just stamps.com all the time. So if you have two minutes, and literally it will take you two minutes, it's one page, one screen on, on a browser window, please take a moment and go take a look at the survey. There, <laughs> we noticed, a few of us on Twitter last week, noticed that the options that they give you are a little limited. It's kind of like <laughs> we had a survey before. It was a uh, what kind of animal do you have? Do you have dogs? Do you have cats? Do you have fish? <laughs> that was it. There were no, there's no other. There was no, I don't have pets. It's, it's a little, it's a little like that. So I would say answer the closest that you can get, knowing that what they're looking for is what kind of things are you interested in? What kind of, what kind of home life do you have? You know, are you single? Are you footloose and fancy free? Are you tied down? Do you have a ball and chain? <laughs> I don't think they actually care about that, do they? Probably not. Can you imagine if you went to the survey and it said, happily married, ball and chain, separating, 
divorced. That would just be awful. Possibly more accurate, but but awful. Premium audio. You've heard me mention this before the book, but if you're a new listener, you may not have known what I was talking about. Craftlet is a free podcast and will always be free because of the fabulous people who listen and donate. There is a secondary podcast. It doesn't have a particular name. It is just audiobooks with benefits. There's no crafty chat. There's not even a normal theme song. The music changes with the books. And if you're interested in subscribing to that, it's $5 a month. It's a recurring charge. And you can either sign up from the free Craftlit smartphone tablet app, which is out on Android and iOS and Windows 8. And you can listen to it as a streaming subscriber. It's super easy if you do it that way, because all you have to do is look at the screen and certain episodes will have little icons that look like little locks, like a padlock. Tap on that and it'll lead you through the process to sign up. Now, if you don't want to stream audio, if you want to be able to download the audio and have it in your hot little computer's hands, then you can become a downloading member. There is a link in the sidebar of the show notes at craftlit.com that shows you a picture of a smartphone. If you click on that, it'll take you to the information about signing up for the smartphone. There is a picture of an MP3 player, old school, like an iRiver. Click on that and it'll take you to the site that explains how to become a downloading subscriber. It costs the same no matter what you do. Some people really prefer the convenience of streaming. Some people really prefer having the files on their hard drives for whenever they need them. Totally up to you. After a certain amount of time, files are retired and rebundled and put into the shop. So people who subscribe today, you won't get Alice in Wonderland from two years ago or Wuthering Heights from three years ago. You will have access to Bleak House, however. (laughs) <laughs> it may take you another year to listen to it. So that is what the premium audio is. And if you're interested, just follow the links in the right-hand sidebar of the show notes. But there is another thing that you can do to both support the show and have a little fun. John and Hank Green, who you may know from a little book called The Fault in Their Stars and The Sci Show and Crash Course and The Vlog Brothers. These two got a gazillion dollar grant from Google a few years ago, and they used it to build a site called Subbable. It is a site that they curate. They only allow a certain number of podcasts and webcasts in that meet their criteria, and Craftlit was one of those shows. What this means is you can subscribe over at Subbable to get an email every time a new episode pops up, and you can do that for free. Nobody's stopping you. Now, if you wanted to donate something to the show, you can do it through Subbable. You can pick your price. You want to give 50 cents a month to the show? Fantastic. You want to give $500 a month to the show? That's great. But the cool part about Subbable is that if you give anything, it goes into a bank. And that bank sits there and grows every time you donate. It grows until you have enough money in your bank that you can do something with it. And the kinds of things you can do are kind of fun. Like we have some got book postcards that are all classic pieces of art, like the Mona Lisa. But instead of it just being the Mona Lisa, she's listening to her Android phone on her earbuds and she's listening to Craftlet. So there's a bunch of those and you can see pictures of them at the website. Or you can get a USB bracelet with a Craftlet logo on it. And that USB bracelet can either come as a blank two gigabyte bracelet, or it can come with an audiobook loaded onto it. You can commission your own book if you want. Uh, project bags. Oh, there's, there's all sorts. Of, there's tons of stuff. T-shirts. Go take a look. All of the information is over there at subbable.com slash Craftlet. And if there is a perk that you do not see there that you really would like, let me know because we can update and change the perks on almost a whim. Not quite a whim, sort of like a whim. It takes a little bit more time than whims usually do. All right. Well, that about wraps it up for our first Herland episode. Welcome to all of our new listeners. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you liked the beginning of the book and I hope you're here with us next week. 
To my longtime listeners, thank you so much for coming back. I am always so proud and happy, and I feel enormously grateful every time I talk to somebody about the listeners of this show. Y'all are amazingly wonderful people. You always have been for the last eight and a half years, and I look forward to spending many, many more years with you. Thank you so much for coming and listening. I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye. Like Craftlet? You can leave a review for us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, subscribe at Subbable, or link to us when you comment on literary blogs. You can listen to Craftlet via our free iOS, Android, and Windows 8 app. And using that app, you can also access premium member audio. Craftlet is made possible by the generosity of its listeners. And for that, I am truly grateful. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.